mon nom est Paul, à l'Université de Professeur à la Faculté de l'Université de et titulaire de la Chambre de Recherche Canada en droit et environnement. Mon collègue Christophe Collet se joint à moi, qui est titulaire de la Chambre de Recherche en innovation en droit des ressources naturelles et de l'énergie. Donc, c'est bien moi de souhaiter la bienvenue à cette conférence médicale que nous avons organisée en partenariat avec l'Institut de Québec dans ma région et les agences ici. Alors, nous sommes très heureux, très heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui nos collègues de l'Église, Sylvie Lorand et M. Jeffrey Garbert. Et je profite de l'occasion pour dire que nous suivons les travaux de Jeffrey Garbert et de M. Lorand depuis de plusieurs années. Alors, nous avons déjà eu le plaisir d'entendre l'invité avec le professeur Lorand en 2006, la première fois. Il est venu nous parler de stewardship économique. Euh, C'était une économie de biosphère, donc en 2006. Et ils sont revenus tous les deux en 2009, alors qu'ils venaient de, de, de sortir de leur nouveau livre, Right Relationship, Building a Old Earth Economy. Donc, on est des travaux très intéressants de se poursuivre. Très heureux de les accueillir aujourd'hui pour venir nous parler de l'anthropocène, de cette ère euh, géologique qu'on appelle, euh, dans laquelle nous serions entrés, l'anthropocène. Et leur, euh, leur activité aujourd'hui se doublée. Donc, donc ce midi, ils, ils ont une conférence dans laquelle ils vont euh, nous, nous, nous présenter une réflexion sur les causes premières, les causes fondamentales qui auraient pavé la voie à ce qu'on entre dans une ère de l'anthropocène. Et ensuite, ils vont nous parler des activités d'un programme, d'un partenariat international de recherche sur l'économie formée en procès, E4A, notamment la dimension euh, droit et gouvernance. Et cet après-midi, ils vont poursuivre à 2h30, toujours dans cette salle, ils vont venir euh, euh, apporter des réflexions sur les pistes de solutions et euh, donner des détails également sur le programme de ce partenariat de l'économie sport et anthropocène. Alors, rien que vous vous compréhensez, mon collègue Victor Rand est le père de la de l'Université de Columbia. Il est professeur de plus de nombreuses années à Médine, où il enseigne à l'école d'environnement au département de géographie et sciences des ressources naturelles. Il est l'auteur de très nombreux ouvrages, je ne vais pas vous les dénommer parce qu'ils ont plus de 30 ans en France. Et ces ouvrages s'intéressent à la gouvernance de l'art et euh, aux impacts de euh, l'économie, notamment de l'économie. Il est aussi un des principaux initiateurs de l'économie euh, internationale, I4A. Donc, une question, je vais vous dire. Je suis ingénieur de formation. Il est également juriste de formation. Il a même deux diplômes dans les universités de l'art. Et il est actuellement doctorant au département de géographie de l'Université de McGill, où il coordonne le programme économique sur les anthropocènes. Il a occupé différentes fonctions, c'est très intéressant de discuter avec Jeff, il a été avocat au sein du département de la justice aux États-Unis. Il a également passé plusieurs années à l'EPA aux États-Unis. Et il a œuvré pendant plusieurs années comme directeur de l'unité de communication à la Commission de coopération environnementale, dont nous avons le siège social à Montréal. Et donc, il a été aussi membre du comité de l'Université. Il est entendu avec eux qu'ils vont nous entretenir de 50 à 60 minutes. Donc, mon collègue, pour moi, va s'exprimer en anglais, lui demander de ne pas parler trop rapidement. Euh, et par ailleurs, à, à, là, ce sera la, question de, à la période des questions après la présentation de 50 minutes. Vous pourrez poser vos questions en français si vous voulez. Et on va s'assurer que les questions euh, lui soient traduites. Alors, je vais m'arrêter et je les remercie de nous jouer. Je vous cède la parole et je vous reviens tout à l'heure pour les questions. Merci. J'espère que vous m'entendez bien. Oui. 
I'm going to apologize for speaking in English. If you spoke, uh, spoke in French, it would be extremely frustrating uh, in the wrong direction. So uh, Professor Ali has reminded me to, to uh, speak rather slowly, so I'll try to do that, but she's also going to give me the slow down time if needed. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to be here. I've come here uh, several times, and it's been a pleasure and it's been very stimulating. Uh, I'm also grateful for this clock on the wall uh, that's over here. Um, because um, it's, uh, it's a good metaphor for what I'm going to talk about. Right? It's, in the first place, it's not connected to reality. As far as we know, time has not stopped. Right? Um, and, and secondly, um, um, it's, it so shows that certain things can get frozen in time. Right? So those are actually going to be two of the things I'm going to, I'm going to talk about. Um, and I guess I should apologize to Stephanie Watt for some of this you've heard before, but anyway, you're a better critic, therefore. I'm uh, ready for some good questions from you. Um, so, so mainly what I'm going to talk about is um, the human place in the universe, and um, that's why I've chosen this, this um, wonderful painting by, by Van Gogh. It's, um, it's, it's just um, when the, these are gas lights here around the harbor. This is the sky, obviously, and it's, it's an ironic picture because it's just about the time when the human-made uh, light systems started to drown out you know, the night sky, uh, which is uh, pretty well accomplished now. I mean, near Loch Magantic and places hasn't happened yet, but um, it's so, so our knowledge of the universe has increased enormously in the last 50 years, but our experience of it has declined. Right? So uh, it's, a, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a paradox. Um, so the main thing I'm going to talk about is um, the role of higher education in the Anthropocene, both in, the, in bringing the Anthropocene about as a phenomenon, uh, and also in failing to rise to the challenges of the Anthropocene. Right? So I, I think there's a, a pretty uh, complicit path that uh, institutions such as the ones I've taught at, uh, have played. And, um, I just put Peter Sellers' name there and remind myself of a, of a little metaphor from his one of his films, The Magic Christian, where he's, uh, he plays the richest man in the world and holding a board meeting on a train, and it uh, turns out all his companies are failing, and so he has the train uh, stop, and he gets it makes everybody get off, all his board members, and as he gets off, um, each each of them get off, he hands uh, hands them a map, but none of them are maps of where they are. Right, they're just random maps. The downtown Auckland, you know, Cincinnati, you know, um, uh, Vancouver, and so forth. But no map. This takes place in England, but no maps of Yorkshire. So I think that's what we do in higher education, right? We, we hand people uh, a diploma, but it isn't a diploma that equips them uh, to work in the world um, which we and, and others have, have created. So first, just say, uh, since I'm I mean, a bit pressed for time, I'll, I'll go a little quickly through some of this stuff. Uh, the Anthropocene um, is debated whether this is a true new geological era. Um, I'm not bothered by that. Uh, this is a beautiful metaphor for describing a situation we're in where humans have become a predominantly uh, a predominant force in the biogeochemical processes of the planet, changing the ocean, obviously the atmosphere, <coughs> changing land cover, and so forth. And this was preceded by a period of relative stability of about 10,000 years called the whole thing. So, so the project that um, so Jeff and Robert and uh, many others have worked on uh, together it is to try to rethink the role of economics in a new geological era. Um, but we're also trying to rethink a number of the other disciplines for, for sort of similar reasons. Um, so here's a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about, that we're, we're embedded in a, in a par partially or fully embedded in a narrative uh, that has uh, elements that, of, of which are just simply false. But secondly, I'm going to talk about why narratives are essential, um, and uh, then how two competing worldviews uh, have arisen, um, the role of higher education, in uh, creating and uh, blocking, creating the Anthropocene and in blocking um, uh, proper uh, or, or robust ways of dealing with it. Um, and um, so I'm going to start with um, the, the need for narrative. Uh, it's like taken from a work by Robert Nadeau, 
a friend of mine who was at uh, Jordan Mason University. And uh, the basic argument here is that once humans attain the ability for uh, complex symbolic language, both in words and numbers, um, that um, we, we are self, our sense of self separated from the, the world. Um, we became aware of ourselves as individual beings. And we developed, uh, as a result of this, um, you know, it, it, uh, we, we have internal lives, right? We think about, oh, I'm going to miss a bus, you know, or I forgot my shopping list, you know, or I'm wondering about the distance or lack of distance done, and so forth. These are all things that can go on in our minds. And what narrative does is to connect the interior dialogue to the external world and um, allows us to orient ourselves um, in, in that world. So in, in um, most of the time since this, this since symbolic uh, thinking and, and manipulation became possible, uh, this, has been, this integration has been done by religious narratives, but since the last several hundred years, it's been increasingly challenged by, by scientific narratives. Um, and in the, um, there's been, it's been uh, enormous progress in scientific understanding of the Earth and the universe and humanity in the last uh, 200 years, but especially since World War II, you know, the, the understanding has uh, really been, been uh, increased at an, at an astonishing rate. Um, but um, what's happened then, I'll come back to this a little bit later, is that certain sections of the academy have not really been able to uh, be informed by these scientific developments for reasons I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about. And this, this is what I think creates the sort of uh, wasteful or even tragic situation that we're in. Um, so, so for first world overview, I'm going to talk about what's called the Emancipation Project, uh, an idea I got from Herkheimer and Adorno. Herkheimer and Adorno's um, the uh, dialectic of enlightenment, and um, the, sort of the, the basic notion is that that the Western project has been one to seek emancipation. Emancipation from nature through agriculture, um, emancipation from obligations to others by thinking of ourselves as a better people and, and the rest of the world is populated by lesser peoples. And then also that the human self it, it, it's, uh, must also, the human self must fit sort of the overall paradigm of, of the culture. Um, and the self conception is not the only thing that has. Uh, brought on these, uh, these problems have been technical and uh, other dimensions, such as agriculture and the rise of capitalism, things like that. But um, the, the Emancipation Project goes back about 10,000 years. And I want to argue that it's embedded in a narrative that's, in fact, uh, quite uh, not only outmoded, but dangerous. Um, so this is a picture of Carolyn Merchant. I'm taking this from a book that she wrote called um, uh, reinventing Eden, uh, the fate of nature in Western culture. And so I'm just going to give a quick sketch of her argument. Um, so, um, and if this will be familiar to uh, many, many people, of course. Um, so the, the, the project gets underway, as it is, or early in the project. Uh, you know, human beings are uh, passed out of uh, paradise. Uh, and these are this picture painting contains a lot of the elements of that. This is man being created in the image of God. This is God creating uh, Eve from the rib of Adam, and this is this is uh, Eve uh, deceiving Adam, which sort of starts the whole uh, story going. Of course, and if you notice here, Eve has two heads, and one of them is connected to the body of a snake. Um, so. Um, this um, the part of this narrative is that God uh, made man in His image, and then gives uh, the earth to uh, men and the sons of men, not humanity, by the way. If you look at what it says in the Old Testament. I believe it's it's men that are given the earth. Um, and then in the um, but later on, or much later, in the Middle Ages, uh, this notion is in the development of, of Christian theology. Um, it comes along the idea of the great chain of being, where the, the better thing is uh, at the top near God, and the bottom of things is a rock and uh, things, things like, like the earth. Um, and what, what um, Carolyn's arg argument is, 
that the Western Project is an attempt to get back into the paradise, right? To, to find, to recreate the world in such a way that paradise, uh, we can live in paradise. And recall in the, in the Genesis story, when human, when humans fall, when humans are expelled from paradise, the well-being of the earth is also affected, right? The, the earth is, is it, itself becomes degraded. So her analysis of this would be that the, pro the project is to get back from here, this desolate wilderness, back to paradise, and I'll show you in just a minute that it actually worked. Um, and th this, is a kind of, this is a very famous quote from um, Francis Bacon, um, but um, this is a notion that we can, we can reassert our dominion over creation through technology, um, and through, through the kind of things that happen at um, leading, leading universities, can bring us back to uh, our proper state. Um, and, and this has had um, has three features that, that we're, that there's a chosen species, that's us, right? The chosen people, people of the book in a way, and then there, this has led to uh, basically a uh, period of uh, expansion on the part of the West. There's a really great book I just came across this summer called Earth Into Property by Stanley Hall, who's a professor at Lethbridge. Uh, really just a terrific book. And it, it will um, you know, benefit you in a number of ways. In the first place, it's got a great argument, but it's also very heavy, right? So it'll improve your upper body strength uh, as a concern. Uh, so this is just a, a really uh, almost incredible image of the confidence in, in Western culture, right? This, this is a very famous painting, uh, but it's it's what's amazing about it is it's completely unabashed, right? This is this is what progress is: it's getting rid of these other species, these other people. It's bringing technology from this is Brooklyn Bridge, and the enlightenment all comes from Europe, and the darkness is the wilderness, right? The un the untaken uh, place. So anyway, I'm going a little fast here because I know we're constrained, but. Um, Here's a picture of success, right? Supposed to recreate the paradise, and it was done. In fact, it's amazingly like, if you go back to Thomas Gold painting, it's a little bit like what that would be, right? It's got it's the Edmonton Mall, right? <clears throat> Palm trees, swimming pools, warm, cold as hell outside, it's nice and warm in there, to take a swim. <clears throat> and you can have potato chips and Diet Pepsi anytime you want, right? And so, obviously, the perfect place. So um, anyway, this this uh, here's how I, I think this tradition has helped to create the current set of crises. Um, first place, it's got um, it's strongly dualistic, right? There there is the notion that that the sacred is in heaven. It also has the notion, of course, of God as being active in history. And this is kind of complicated. I can go back to that. Any questions? But. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? That's that's a very clear description of where God primarily is. The earth is fallen and in need of reclamation. Um, and some of what Robert will say this afternoon, I think we'll draw on some of that kind of language. Uh, the human earth relationship in at least in, in uh, Anglo-Saxon derived countries is um, one of property. The notion, this notion of human dominion lacks balance with the needs of other species, and in many cases with the needs of future generations, and it lacks traction with the problems of the anthropocene. So it's really pretty much a mess. Um, so what's happening is everybody, probably everybody's seen this diagram. This is the planetary boundaries diagram from from. Uh, <coughs> Rockstrom and that all um, So if, I'm not going to talk about it, it would take more time than I've got. But basically, this is a warning diagram that we're maybe possibly pushing some of the Earth, Earth's limits in a way that could backfire. Maybe a principal one, obviously, is climate change. And then with the possibility of crossing some thresholds, such as um, large scale methane release in the Arctic, which would have uh, very, very strong uh, warming res results. Uh, because of the intensity of um, heat, heat blocking potential of uh, methane molecules. And we're losing the living planet, right? The number of plant species is declining and the number of animals within, plants and animals within each species 
declining. And then, of course, you know, we've got um, the population consumption crisis, um, which is uh, particularly um, strong in North America. Um, so, okay, so that's just sort of one view, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the other view, and then how higher education you know, align, perhaps align itself. Um, so, in, in the period, um, well, starting with Charles Darwin and even before, and the, the Scottish geologists of the um, early part of the 19th century, people began to raise questions well, how old is the Earth? And, um, by the way, I'm thinking of at an intelligible rate. Okay. Okay, um, so Scottish geologists said, well, let's, the Earth can't really be only five or six thousand years old, right? Because we can see that the building topsoil takes a really long time. And so that, that was sort of the opening wedge on question, questioning um, Judeo-Christian narrative. Um, and the, um, uh, of course, the hugely important was Darwin's work and so forth. So I don't really need to go through all, all of that. Um, in the post-war period, we started to gain uh, very substantial knowledge uh, about how the universe as a whole works and began to see uh, biological evolution as a special case of cosmic evolution. And this, this was advanced um, enormously by, by the Hubble Space Telescope and other things like that. And so there are now people around, Eric Chase on to the example, who, uh, who are saying, you know, we really have at least the rudiments of a, of a theory of cosmic evolution in which we can fit biological evolution. So, so there, there, he wrote a book called The Ethics of Evolution. It's really a terrific book on the subject. And so all this does is remind us that we're part of the universe, right? So this is, um, you know, wouldn't be news to anybody but economists. Um, so um, I'll move past that slide. Um, so, so the basic building blocks are, are, are this. this is a, there's a vast creative process around 14 billion years. Um, that a lot of this has been, the understanding of this has been improved by um, advances in, in um, understanding of how thermodynamics works, uh, particularly um, far from equilibrium thermodynamics. We've got a better understanding of the relationship between mind or consciousness and nature than we had before. And um, as a result of this, in my view, really, we need to change our whole metaphysical framework. So I just, I just got a few images here. This is an image of the Big Bang. Um, the photograph of NASA, called, uh, it's unlabeled continuous creation. It's called the Pillars of Creation by, by NASA. And um, the, the idea here is that, that there are stars, um, things like the sun are being born kind of continuously all the time. Uh, so, so we have a, um, rather than a, <clears throat> A situation of the where the universe is created or the world is created, the world is creative. Right? And, and so the great chain of being gets tipped upside down in this way of looking at it because mind, so this is rocks and trees and other stuff like that, right? And mind is at the bottom, right? So mind doesn't, on this cosmology I'm talking about, mind doesn't precede the universe, mind is made possible by the universe. Um, so, This I should go into. Um, I guess the key idea here is that, I mean, it's okay to have a few sentences. The universe is trying to cool itself off. Right. Um, it's using, um, or another way to put this, it's not all that far from what Aristotle said, actually, is that nature abhors a great deal. Right? Wherever there's a difference, nature's going to try to get rid of it. So if I let go of this, it's going to fall to the table. Wherever there's a temperature gradient, the universe is trying to get rid of the temperature gradients. So if you think about the way that works on Earth, the, the winds are basically gradient, are gradients, right? They're dispersal of heat from the, roughly speaking, from the poles, excuse me, from the equator to the poles. The ocean currents are, dis, are also dissipated heat in the same way. And what James Kay and Schneider argued in, in the late 80s and early 90s of the last century was that life itself is a dissipated structure. Right? Life, life itself is one of the mechanisms that the universe has found to get rid of heat gradients. That's a kind of really a short summary of a very complicated subject. Um, so um, the, way, the way this is now thought of is that 
the, the, the things like the Earth are, um, are islands of complexity in a sea of gathering simplicity, right? So in, according to the second law of thermodynamics, everything is moving, everything net is moving from order, um, from order to disorder, everything is sort of in a state of decline unless it has new exogenous energy. So the Earth has a bombardment of energy all the time from the sun, and that allows the Earth to run uphill while the rest of the universe, the other pockets like the Earth, is running down. Okay? So the, the universe is both creating and destroying complexity all the time. But it creates these sort of islands of complexity of which we are one of perhaps many, many examples. Okay, so if you look at things this way, uh, where are you uh, compared to the other narrative? And I think maybe uh, maybe not so great. Right? Um, a lot of what we had to work with, we don't have if you, if you switch over from the first narrative to the second. So Earth isn't rare or at the center of the universe. If you look up the number of habitable planets for NASA, it could be in a number in the range of, uh, of tens of tens of thousands, maybe many more. It's not known, basically. There's no chosen species. We're not chosen by anybody, right? And there's no chosen people. Um, that would have a revolutionary impact on uh, the way we think about the world. Um, there's no no divine mandate that humans own the earth. Um, there's no soul separate from the body, right? So there's no there's no personal immortality. Um, and there's no exogenous rescue, right? Nobody's going to show up from someplace else and save us from the mess we created, right? Um, just, um, and there's no ex cathedra moral system, right? There's no authority outside of the system and the systems in which we live who can tell us uh, what we do and what we should and shouldn't do, and there's no argument at all for women being inferior to or the property of men, right? That also goes out. I mean, it's kind of a, a clean sweep in a way, right? Um, Metaphysical uh, reference here. Um, so um, anyway, here's my argument about what goes wrong with higher ed. Um, so maybe just stop a minute and let you let you read this. If you can read this section here. Um, Uh, so here's a, a not very pleasant. Goya, Goya is making a comeback, by the way, right? Um, as an artist. Um, so uh, things are kind of grim. Uh, here's a picture of um, Saturn eating his own sun. Right? This is a metaphor, I think, for what higher education is doing to students, right? Because uh, we're not giving you the tools uh, to be basically uh, to flourish. Um, and so we came up with this metaphor, which you have to talk about. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, orphans. That's it. Disciplines whose, um, whose metaphysical, and scientific, and narrative parents have died, but they haven't. Right? They're still alive in, in the world. Little 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 kids um, that are, are still um, affected in, in, uh, in what we think, how we think and what we do. And so my my list of those um, disciplines that I have here. The ones that are explicitly normative, the ones that say what you should do, are economics, finance, law, governance, yeah, ethics, and religion, religion, and ethics. It's supposedly complicated. Uh, but these, these aren't, so these are really problematical, in my opinion. But that's not where the mission stops, because these, it influence, these disciplines all influence these other ones. Right? So even if you could straighten this mess out, right, you'd have the, the way these have permeated. Uh, much of the rest of higher education would not be fixed, right? So, you, so it's a big, big problem. Talk to that. No, I'm good. I've got time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the norms. Um, okay, so here's an image of contemporary uh, economics. <laughs> Everything is thought of as the of the economy. As you know, the leaders are going to talk tonight about, about the future of the Canadian economy. This is the important issue of the election, according to CBC News. Um, okay. Um, everything is in worship of this rather abstract idea. So the economy it dominates. The society has to be rearranged through the trade agreements and other things by which we're resigning our sovereignty. 
uh, to fit the needs of the economy. And then, of course, we should leave a little bit of the natural world, about 15%. Um, so if you look at things from the point of view of the project, the E4A project, uh, you reverse this. You, so you start with the characteristics of the biosphere, you fit society within that, and then you fit the economy within society's goals. Um, let's skip this for sort of time. So, um, so what we've done is that we leave the operation of the planet to the high priests of the space foster religion. Um, and this is Mark Carney, the head of the Bank of England now, Janet Yellen, the head of the Bank of the Federal Reserve in the US. Um, these are the two of the most dangerous people on Earth, in my opinion, right? Um, because um, the, the control they have over the future of the biogeochemical systems of the planet is enormous. Uh, so yeah, so here's another, this is, this is really amazing. Really so I got a textbook in finance, and I started an elementary textbook. I started to read it, and it was really boring, to say the truth. But but so I thought, well, I'll better look. I'll look for references to the Earth. I'll look for references to global warming or species extinction or anything like that. Nothing. Um, so one of the most astonishing things about about the whole finance situation right now is hardly anybody seems to think about this. Um, so the Earth, so 1980, the Earth was, had, had a certain size, obviously, and there was a certain amount of money, checks, you know, mortgages, the whole thing, the money, derivatives, everything. Let's say, that's what it looked like. This is, not, this is now 2015. This is the money supply in 1980, this is the money supply now. The Earth is the same. Is this a problem? Well, interestingly enough, nobody seems to know, right? Or even thought about it. But I had I had lunch summer before last with somebody from the Bank of Canada, and I asked him that question, and he said he never thought about the question. Um, and so I started to try to read in the literature and see if anybody was thinking about it. And it doesn't. It appears that they're not. Right? It's it's just built you know, more more liquidity. Anyway, it's a misunderstanding of what real wealth is, right? Wealth isn't paper money or, or little things in your checking, electronic things in your checking account. Wealth is essentially based on sunlight and photosynthesis. So, um, okay, so governance is another, another problem. Um, this, is, this is a photo, this is a painting from um, somewhere in Brown. Toward the latter half of the 19th century. This is uh, American stuff. Right? Um, so it's Thomas Jefferson, everybody's heard of him, now we Franklin um, and Adams. I just want to show this painting because that's rather amusing. Um, so this is this is Jefferson, and Adams, and Franklin. And what I, I think is important about this painting is that not all the mistakes made their way to the floor. Right, that that um, when drafting the Declaration of Independence, I think a certain number of <laughs> conceptual, um, from, in a, from the benefit of hindsight, it looks like there were some pretty big mistakes made. Um, one of which was defining the human earth relationship as one of property. So, so Thomas Jefferson, you guys probably don't know this, but Th Thomas Jefferson was a drafter of the Declaration of Independence, a super smart guy. Um, and um, he was, he was, he wrote the famous sentence, all men are created equal, uh, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. He also was a slave owner. So it's a little bit off, right? Um, and he also had, one of his slaves was his mistress, uh, from whom, uh, who bore him, or them, I guess, several children. So that's a little untidy too, right? But uh, he also, What's not noticed about Jefferson is that he enslaved the whole world by making the human earth relationship one of property. Right? So, so the, in this concept, in this construct, that's how we relate um, directly in, 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 this, in this space to earth. Um, Okay, the other maybe um, the other thing I want to talk about is just these these other premises that are in that are in um, Jefferson's way of thinking. Uh, one is the sovereign state, uh, second sovereign person, and the third, the one I think is most important, the paradox of natural right of liberty. 
Uh, so anyway, here's the sovereign state. You know, as you can tell, I've been around a while, so this, this kind of thing was in my classroom when I was a kid. Um, and um, that's how we're still thinking, right? The nations of the world are going to join in Paris later on in the year. And the uh, trouble is, that's how it works, right? So um, it's kind of um, framework of thinking is really out of touch with how, how this works. Uh, there's no such thing as an average sovereign person either, right? Uh, we're we're um, constantly in an energy and material exchange with the whole with the world, right? I, I have since I eat pretty much anything that comes along, you know, I have lots of Monsanto engineered um, you know, DNA in my hair, right? Uh, you know, I, I probably should be labeled Monsanto or some other thing, right? So, so then we're also you know in all in within social and make, make constantly changing systems, uh, and then the, the um, the big problem, though, is with liberty. I just want to take uh, a minute on that. The purpose of this picture is that any speech can should have as much uh, nudity in it as possible. Right? So, uh, take care of that. Um, so, the way to um, um, here's, here's how here's, here's the problem. Uh, what's the what is the boundary of liberty? And the traditional answer to that, given by, by John Stuart Mill, is uh, well, you can do anything you want to do, provided it doesn't harm anybody else. But in the Anthropocene, it's not clear what that is, right? Because everything we do requires energy, and the and energy is what creates the greenhouse creates the greenhouse effect, and it also creates climate change. And it also creates problems. Uh, in the in the in the in, in ambient air pollution in, in, in the in large cities. So um, and we're we're uh, we had Matt Lachmiel uh, from uh, University of Manitoba speaking with Miguel this week, and, and he was emphasizing how cheap energy is in North America. Nine percent of family budget spent on energy. It's absolutely you know a bit right? um, and um, what. When we burn fossil fuels, we kill other people. Right? Just doesn't seem to be any way around that. Um, so I think that any so one of the problems with the foundational principles of the United States is it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is you can't have liberty as a foundational principle in a society in which there are limits, right? Because there has to be then some sense of what claim each person can have on a limited resource, and that's not provided. So I kind of re kind of downgraded liberty a little bit to say liberty is should be not a fundamental doctrinality, it is a grounding principle, but it's a principle. But it has to exist within a larger framework of justice. Okay, so that's just what I said. Mm -hmm. Now um, um
really that else. The other is a problem, but, but this is really where it's, it's the biggest issue is. Um, if you had a chemistry department that taught phlogiston theory of energy from the 19th century, you'd close it, right? If you had a ge geology department that didn't teach plate tectonics, you'd close that, right? You're just not going to have teaching stuff that goes on and on and on that flies in the face of well-documented scientific information. So if you apply that test to economics and finance, what happens? Because in, in the making of, and if you look at macroeconomic textbooks, I've read them, read, you know, the ones that even written by the, by the Fed chiefs, there's no relationship whatsoever between economic policy and the biogeochemical processes of the planet. But there's enormous influence of, of what those policies do. Okay, so here's just a couple of other. Let's see where I have on the slide. Okay, so the second thing is um, we need within the universities to rebuild the edifice of knowledge, right? And not to have partitioned off the arts and the humanities and uh, social sciences off to the side somewhere and let them go their own merry way because they're doing a lot of harm. Right? Um, so what? This suggests what we suggested in the project is that we need to uh, reconcile these disciplines um, with, with the underlying scientific narrative. We're not suggesting at all that we reduce these disciplines to principles of science, but what's, what's amazing about this is that the disciplines are uninformed by contemporary science. So the, the start is to say, okay, if you're gonna have, you're gonna teach finance, you've gotta teach finance in the context Planetary biogeochemical systems, etc. Okay, um, and then uh, so the other ones I maybe that's sort of the main points. Where maybe I can come back to any of these questions. But I want to keep within the uh, prescribed time limit. So, are you ready? <laughs> Moi, je vais essayer de vous parler en français. J'espère que ce n'est pas trop frustrant pour, pour, pour vous, mais euh, on va voir. Donc moi, je, je vais vous donner un, juste un résumé du, du projet économique pour l'anthropocène. Euh, J'ai oublié de mettre, je pense, le, le site web qui est juste e 4 netorg et euh, on, a, on a fait euh, la, la traduction en français de, de, de la plupart euh, du site web. Donc, pour en, pour en euh, savoir davantage, euh, vous avez cette euh, ressource. Euh, aussi, on a juste le, 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 le symbole euh, en anglais, mais le catch, je pense que si on, on le met de l'autre sens, c'est un peu comme un prix. Donc, <rire> vu qu'on met trop euh, l'argent au sein. Et. Euh, euh, c'est pas juste l'économie, il y a une euh, raison bizarre pour pourquoi on appelle notre projet ça. Euh, c'est vraiment de, de réorienter euh, la, la relation entre l'être humain et, et la terre. Euh, c'est un partenariat euh, de 25 partenaires. Euh, et au cours du partenariat, il y a l'Université de Miguel, l'Université du Vermont et l'Université de York. Et les autres partenaires, et ce n'est pas fixe, on peut en acheter si ce si serait intéressant. Euh, chaque, chacun de nos autres partenaires euh, est lié à, à un aspect du projet, plusieurs, plusieurs aspects. Donc on a, on a un travail, euh, euh, on, a, on, on, avait, on, on, on voulait avoir un, un bon un mélange. Et, à date, on pense qu'on a réussi. Vous pouvez voir, Cancy, uh, uh, c'est le uh, Hispanic Canadian Society for Ecological Economics. Uh, IASD is the International Institute for Sustainable Development. IRIS, Institute of Recherche. Merci. Uh, donc, uh, et eux et uh, Kouravar, c'est un. Um, euh, exactement. Donc, euh, on a des, des, des organismes francophones euh, euh, intégrés, mais euh, bon. Euh, 
Et ça, c'est la partie du projet, ça, ça donne comme, le, le, le gros plan de, euh, de ce qu'on fait. Donc, d'abord, il y a, la part de, il y a des, des participants. Euh, on a un advisory board, un, des experts, un euh, steering committee, um, qui est les membres du steering committee, c'est deux, deux profs de chaque des trois, trois euh, universités très um, Puis, beaucoup de, de profs euh, parmi nos collaborateurs, pas juste à McGill. Contrast is poor, I try to read the letter. Donc, on a nos, 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 nos étudiants de deuxième année, de troisième cycle, donc on est doctorat et des fils. Puis les partenaires, euh, partenaires sont des, des organismes, des institutions, euh, toujours, et collaborateurs sont des individus. Donc, euh, on, a beaucoup, on a au moins 60 collaborateurs qui viennent des fois de, de nos. Euh, Partner, mais d'autres organismes aussi. Puis on a une catégorie qu'on appelle Community Scholars. Ce sont des gens, par exemple, euh, euh, une femme cette année qui, qui est membre des, euh, du institut Adenac au Bouéjé, près de. de, de, de euh, de l'État de Michigan. Euh, elle, a, elle travaille beaucoup de, dans le domaine de, de l'eau et elle participe dans nos réunions, dans, nos, dans quelques, euh, des, des cours avec des étudiants pour partager et recevoir, euh, recevoir euh, les connaissances. Donc, c'est vraiment l'idée, c'est d'avoir un échange dans les deux sens avec, euh, avec ces, ces membres qui ne sont pas nécessairement, nécessairement académiques. Et comment pourquoi Donc il y a le. le, le euh, enfin, entraînement, l'éducation des étudiants. Euh, donc on a, on a le, des, des, des cours euh, obligatoires. Euh, sur, par exemple, euh, Peter Brown, euh, maintenant, est en train de euh, enseigner un cours qui s'appelle. La, From the Big Bang to the Anthropocene, qui touche beaucoup des, 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 des sujets qui viennent de, de résumer dans son discours. Um, des cours sur uh, l'économie écologique et les, les méthodes de, 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 de l'économie écologique. Puis on demande à tous nos étudiants d'avoir un, un stage avec un de nos partenaires ou un autre organisme où ils vont avoir l'occasion d'appliquer un peu ce qu'ils ont euh, appris dans les cours. Euh, et dans la deuxième année du programme, euh, les, les étudiants se sont euh, divisés en trois groupes euh, pour faire euh, organiser et euh, présenter des séminaires ou sur l'économie et la finance, ou sur le droit et la gouvernance, ou sur l'éthique. Et, euh, donc, euh, ça, c'est quelque chose qui vient juste de commencer cette année, cette année avec nos, nos, nos premières portes d'étudiants. Puis, chaque étudiant va avoir, euh, étudiant étudiant, va, va avoir son propre euh, thèse ou euh, recherche de doctorat de maîtrise. On, on a trois euh, cohortes. Euh, les, les, les étudiants qui, sont, qui ont commencé il y a un an. Euh, se disent sur, euh, sur l'eau, les, les problèmes de l'eau. Um, maintenant, on a juste commencé un nouveau euh, nouvelle cours sur, euh, sur l'énergie. Et la, l'année prochaine, ça serait sur la justice euh, climatique. Ce n'est pas juste sur le climat, le genre climatique, mais surtout la justice climatique. Et bon, on s'adresse par exemple à cette, euh, cette idée que si quelqu'un ici euh, au Québec, qui conduit, qui brûle euh, les carburants, avoir un effet sur euh, les fumes. Il y a un Bangladesh qui, qui sont menacés par. Euh, euh, les, 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 les inondations, oui. Um, donc, et pour chaque, chacun des, des cohortes, ils vont tous prendre les mêmes euh, cours euh, 
de fond, de fond du monde. Mais il y a ce qu'on appelle un field course, un cours de gens, euh, qui touchera euh, le sujet principal. Et c'est ça que tous ces étudiants sont obligés de faire un maîtrise ou un doctorat sur le thème d'eau, par exemple, s'ils sont dans le corps. C'est juste une manière d'apprendre euh, les principes de l'économie écologique et leurs applications dans les autres domaines. Euh, mais on a eu le, notre premier euh, cours sur l'eau euh, en juin, mai, juin euh, de cette année. C'était un grand, grand succès. C'était sur euh, la qualité de l'eau de, de lac, euh, lac Champlain, au Vermont. C'était intéressant car c'est un, un bassin versant qui touche pas juste les États-Unis, pas juste un État, mais deux États des États-Unis, plus le Québec. Le Kovaba, par exemple, c'est le, 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 le comité sur euh, le bassin versant de rivière de qui reçoit ces eaux euh, euh, assez contaminées, surtout par une nutrition de phosphore euh, euh, du, du lac Champlain. Donc, et et euh, chaque cohort, dans le Comme dans la troisième année du projet, de, il y aura un symposium sur l'eau. On attend que, on espère à ce point-là, nos étudiants vont avoir euh, des recherches assez avancées pour présenter. Donc, euh, euh, ça, il, y aura, il y aura sur l'énergie et la, la justice climatique aussi. Um, pour les, les transformative outcomes, on a ces quatre euh, objectifs principaux du projet. D'abord, un réseau, un réseau de produits de, 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 de recherche. Donc, ça, c'est un réseau euh, fait par, euh, qui consiste de nos partenaires et nos collaborateurs. Euh, L'idée d'avoir ces, ces trois universités au centre du projet, c'est qu'ils ont chaque un expertise, une expertise sur l'économie écologique. C'est pour avoir plus de cohérence entre deux nos programmes et, euh, et une synergie, euh, on, on les met en, ensemble. Donc, nos étudiants, quand ils prennent des cours donnés par exemple de, de, de l'Université du Vermont, ils sont liés par une vidéoconférence, une technologie de vidéoconférence, euh, qui crée au plus autant que possible l'atmosphère d'un autre un local unifié. Donc, euh, mais ça, à date, ça, ça a marché très bien. Um, L'idée, c'est de faire des recherches qui sont pertinentes, pas juste à, à notre région, mais qui pourraient être euh, dupliquées ou qui ont une pertinence aussi au niveau global. Donc, en formation de, 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 de future leaders, pour l'anthropocène, selon beaucoup des principes que le gouvernement nous a expliqués, euh, les Community Scholars euh, font partie de, de cette euh, expérience. Euh, solution au problème, tout le monde réel, surtout avec nos, 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 nos tours de champ, euh, on intègre nos partenaires qui, qui euh, sont actifs, qui sont. sont euh, en train de, de régler les problèmes jour par jour. Et c'est une manière de, de tester un peu les principes de l'économie écologique, ou euh, les méthodes de méthode, l'économie euh, écologique sur le champ. Um, donc on a les, 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 les produits qu'on a, euh, a, 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 a anticipé, c'est une thèse de matrice de doctorat et beaucoup d'autres manière de communication. Ça peut être notre site web ou toutes sortes de choses où on essaie d'être assez créatif. Et puis l'approchement des disciplines, c'est l'extension de la vision analytique de l'économie écologique à d'autres domaines, comme Peter Brown nous a expliqué. Donc euh, le, 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 le pré, la vision pré-analytique de, de l'économie écologique, c'est représenté par euh, 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 une vision de l'économie avec le biosphère euh, euh, comme base euh, principale et l'économie et so économique et sociale à l'intérieur de ça. Um, 
Donc, c'est voilà, de deux plus pour ça, c'est des, des séminaires que les étudiants vont euh, créer et euh, ça commence maintenant avec euh, le convoiteur sur l'eau. Euh, ils vont produire des, 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 euh, des rapports, etc. Mais on a des projets qui, qui vont durer tout le long du projet, c'est un projet de six ans, sur chacun des thèmes de euh, économie et finance, droit et gouvernance et l'éthique. On est en train de former ces groupes de recherche dont Christophe euh, Codic et Polali, on a un aspect qui vont tous les deux participer euh, et décider ensemble qu'est-ce qu'on va faire. Euh, donc, ça c'est juste. Euh, euh, ça, ça, comme la, la, un peu la chronologie du projet, combien d'étudiants on a financé. Um, et ça, c'est impossible à dire. Mais, um, donc, juste pour montrer que ça, ça va durer six ans, que, que les trois cohortes d'étudiants, ça va prendre six ans pour qu'ils finissent euh, aux, aux études. Um, Gouvernance, je vous ai dit, il y a un steering committee, advisory board, pour chacun des comptes, on va impliquer nos partenaires et nos collaborateurs pour planifier par exemple les, les cours euh, sur le champ. Um, puis comme je vous ai dit, les, les, les groupes de recherche sur, sur les thèmes d'économie et finance, droit et gouvernance et um, Ça c'est... C'est... Comme personne qui bon, passait beaucoup de temps en, en, juste devant mon ordi en, en faisant une euh, demande de, de fonds à CSA. Puis finalement d'avoir l'arrivée de de, de, des étudiants euh, qui sont formidables, c'est vraiment. Euh, c'est incroyable. Juste, ça achève déjà beaucoup de nos, nos, nos espoirs du projet. Donc, eux, ils sont maintenant en train de faire leur, leur séminaire sur euh, les Orphan Disciplines. Donc, il y a deux là d'avoir, euh, d'accueillir notre cohorte sur l'énergie. On a eu un, un week-end ensemble dans, dans le bois pour se, se connaître, commencer à se connaître. Puis, euh, Bientôt, on va commencer à planifier le, le cours, cours de champ sur le champ pour l'été prochain sur l'énergie. Et euh, ça, je n'ai pas le temps de faire. Peut-être que c'est cet après-midi euh, où ce euh, sera disponible. Peut-être que juste les cours ont euh, euh, les, euh, la hardline, les gauches, de euh, nos projets sur euh, le, le droit et la gouvernance. Um, donc, euh, je vais passer par là. Et ça a juste pour euh, des choses qu'on peut discuter. Comment est-ce que le fait de voir ici euh, pourrait s'intégrer dans notre dans projet Institutionnellement, peut-être que le meilleur appartement euh, ou des individus sont, sont bienvenus de s'impliquer en, en tant que collaborateur. Si vous avez des, des idées de, de, de quoi on doit étudier dans ce. Euh, euh, projet assez, ce projet assez radical, euh, c'est bon, ces suggestions sont très bien bienvenues Et comment être créatif en, en partageant nos connaissances, ça aussi, c'est. Euh, on, on invite des, des suggestions pour, pour ça. Ou aujourd'hui ou euh, euh, plus tard. 